it's dark. I wonder where I've heard that one from before, right, Tim? That's right. That's right. We are here again on the Now It's Dark movie podcast. And kind of in these uncertain corona times, these coronavirus times, I hope everyone listening to this is doing well and is staying healthy. Yeah, it's spreading across the globe. Things are are uncertain, and and there's kind of a darkness in the air that a lot of our movie discussions get at. Right, and especially we started doing that with Twin Peaks. Right. Right, that's when we started this podcast. It was largely because of David Lynch's third season of Twin Peaks. And... Actually, the the name itself comes from the movie we're going to talk about today. That's Blue Velvet. Yeah. Now it's dark. And before we jump into our Blue Velvet analysis, I just want to make a special announcement. Now It's Dark has launched a Patreon. Our reasons for doing this are pretty simple. We want to make this channel more sustainable. Both Mike and I work multiple jobs, and it takes a lot of time to research and plan and record and edit these videos. So by supporting us, you can help us get more content out there and to make this more sustainable for us. For as little as five cents a day, upwards of 10 cents a day or 16 cents a day, you can support this channel. The highest tier, five bucks, is like a good cup of coffee a month. Now, some benefits you can get by supporting this channel include being able to ask us questions that we'll handle in our future podcasts and YouTube videos. Uh, You can also get bonus episodes, content that's not available anywhere else. And you also get a say in helping to kind of curate our content and, and decide kind of what direction we go in. We love David Lynch. We want to talk a lot more about David Lynch's films. But there's also other films I know our audience wants to hear us talk about. So... Follow the links below if you want to support Now It's Dark. And before we jump into the Blue Velvet analysis, make sure you've seen it, because this is a spoiler warning. I'm also going to be appearing at one point to update our original podcast. So if you've already listened to that, there's more new content in store for you. I hope you enjoy our video. And once again, follow the links below if you want to support our Patreon. I'm seeing something that was always hidden. There's so much in the the way the film is made, the the symbolism of the film, the the cultural and and theoretical references that make it almost impossible to really get a handle on. Yeah. And there's so many ways you could interpret it. I mean, for example, The Wizard of Oz Mm -hmm. is very much an obvious touchstone for Lynch. I mean, that's where he got the name for Dorothy. That's the reason why he decided to have Frank Booth be from Kansas. Right. There's a subplot that was actually cut out of the final cut of the film where Dorothy has red shoes or red slippers, and one of them falls uh, in an, uh, a suicide attempt. Uh, Dorothy herself lives on Lincoln Street, and Frank Booth seems to be named after Lincoln's assassin. Mm-hmm. Uh, Freudian references are everywhere. I mean, Dorothy calls Frank baby. He tells her to call him daddy. Moments later, he's calling her mommy. Right, and that comes after he's just huffed all that weird gas. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that face mask. And listening to what we're saying, because I'm hearing myself talk, and I'm hearing you talk, and we're talking about sadism and masochism and calling each other mommy and daddy, and you can just tell why people hated this at the time. It's bizarre, and I think a lot of people are turned off by bizarre. Yes, but it's also intriguing. I mean, because there just are so many nods to popular culture and, and, you know, like think about the film noir references Mm -hmm. in the film. Dorothy really seems to kind of resemble a a classic femme fatale at points. And there's this whole exploration of, you know, this underworld of drug dealers and criminals that's very much part of film noir. There's also the the bizarre mixture of, of stilted acting and corny dialogue that you mentioned before. Yep. But that's always juxtaposed with scenes of extreme brutality. Right. And I think this is what Roger Ebert in particular objected to. He really kind of resented the fact that Lynch, in his opinion, subjected Isabella Rossellini to moments of incredible humiliation merely as he said, as a counterpoint to an immature satire on small-town comedies. Mm -hmm. And that's painful to me to see a woman treated like that, and Mm -hmm. I want to know that if I'm feeling that pain, it's for a reason that the movie has other than simply to cause pain to her. Well, I think that the reason is that the film is a thriller and a shocker. I mean, Mm -hmm. there are people that get hurt badly in real life, and I think that this is a legitimate one. This is not a simple, mad slasher movie. Then why is it a comedy? 
because he wants to set you up. He's a director, mm -hmm. and he wants to play you like all the directors, the great directors want to do. He wants to play you like a piano, which is have you smile and then swing you right into the, some depression. Yeah, well, the next I think time he, I think he somebody got wants to play me like a piano, he'd better get some music that's worth listening to. Oof, you that's know. harsh. Yeah, for him it was just fodder. It was just kind of a, a, a way to to make the satire a little bit, you know, realer or a little bit rawer. But it wasn't really authentic. It wasn't earned. As well, I think there there are just so many contrasts in the movie that seem pregnant with meaning. I mean, there's the good, innocent Jeffrey and the evil, sadomasochistic Frank, the the dark nightclub singer Dorothy and the blonde, naive schoolgirl Sandy. Blue versus red is a common contrast. The bright surface of manicured lawns and picket fences, along with the underbelly being eaten away by bugs. Yeah, and I think this is why the time that he grew up is, is quite significant to the image he's portraying here. Because if he's growing up with this idealized version of the, the United States, whether or not it really existed, because I alluded to that, that Simpsons quote earlier, he's sort of showing you that either America is no longer this way or it never was in the first place. And I think that very much ties into the way the film blurs the lines between the 80s and the 50s. There's this kind of temporal confusion in the film that's very interesting. I mean, there's obviously 80s references with, say, Jeffrey's pierced ear, the skinny tie he wears, the dream pop in the film, particularly the track Mysteries of Love. Lynch actually wrote the lyrics for it. Uh, but there are some very obvious 50s throwbacks. I mean, the cars, the dresses that a lot of the, the you know, Sandy and her friends wear, uh, as well as, as the decor of the homes themselves. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they're very much a throwback to the 50s. They go into a diner a couple of times as well. That's right. Which, I mean, the 50s diner, that's that's classic. It's it's iconic. Yeah. And Lynch has said that he has a real fondness for, for the 50s, what he calls the, quote, euphoric optimism of the 50s. And you've alluded to this before. Right. This is very much a part of his childhood. Right. He'd have been a, a child in the 50s, right? like 10 years old in 1956. I think he wasn't alone in this, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about the the, the 80s, I think there was uh, it was a time of peak nostalgia for the 50s. I mean, the top movie in 1985 was Back to the Future. That's right. A movie where a guy in the 80s goes back to the 50s and kind of revels in, in nostalgia. There's also Peggy Sue Got Married, the Francis Ford Coppola film, and early Spielberg films like E.T., which are very much a marriage between, you know, kind of a 50s sensibility and, and sense of the nuclear family, along with, you know, more of a Cold War concern or, or anxiety. Right, right, right. A Cold War point of view on things. Yeah. Yeah. And... I think the 80s, as you mentioned, too, it's, it's also the era of Ronald Reagan. So there's there's very much this idea of old Hollywood, an old Hollywood actor kind of coming into the political sphere and really setting up this contrast between this idealized view of small town American life versus all the evils that are out to threaten it, uh, particularly the Soviet you know, empire at that time, but, yeah. but also just, you know secularism and, and all these forces that would intrude on this idealized image. Some have even claimed that this is a celebration of Reagan era moral absolutism, you know, kind of mm. a celebration of, of uh, Ronald Reagan's sense of morality. And I don't think it is. I don't think it is either. I think there's something much more sophisticated going on here. If anything, I think it might speak to the sort of I don't know, like you said earlier, social decay of everything, right? It was in the Reagan era where you started getting that image of a bunch of homeless people setting a garbage can on fire and standing around it. Right. You know? A friend of mine had a great quote where he said the the 70s was the last decade that felt like the 50s mm. and the 80s was the first decade that felt like now. Interesting. Okay. And I think that's... Perhaps what was in Lynch's head, in a way, there was something going on, a transformation that he was aware of, even though maybe he couldn't articulate it on the level of, of sociological analysis or political analysis, he felt like something was going on. And I think what's really happening, and the reason why he mixes together all these genres and references and contrasts, is to examine American identity as it was you know, undergoing transformation in the 1980s, suffering under the weight of decades of, of cultural baggage and unresolved traumas. It's a strange world, isn't it? 
Because I think American identity in the 80s was especially fraught with tension, with, with these different sorts of trends kind of intermingled and coexisting together. I mean, on the one hand, you have the post-war sensibility, you know, the sense of optimism, the New Deal, and the real material gains that are represented in things like the white picket fences and the manicured lawns and the nice homes and the nice cars. On the other hand, you have these kind of unmistakable signs of an impending decline in America. You know, first and foremost, I think, with, with sexual assault and domestic abuse, which Dorothy Vallens kind of perfectly embodies. I think you also have rising crime rates in many areas. That starts in the 70s. You have the unraveling of American civic society beginning in the 70s as well, where kind of social bonds start to fray and communities become less close to each other. You have the unraveling and decline of the New Deal itself, where actual material gains start to kind of move backwards, wages stagnate and things like that. Your father's condition is very serious. It's going to cost so much money. There won't be enough money to keep you in school. And you also have the rise of of drugs. I mean, there's the crack epidemic in the 1980s, but you also have, you know, the the rise of psychotropic drugs and all of these kind of antidepressants and things like that, which leads into another kind of factor that was going on, which is the lingering effects of, of 50s repression where people are kind of encouraged not to deal with their emotions, where they're encouraged to repress them. And again, the psychotropic drugs play a role there. When, when Jeffrey's mother is dealing with her own grief and shock at her husband's stroke, she's given a shot. You know, she's kind of given this tranquilizer so she can just calm down. And you see pills on her nightstand in, in you know, a deleted scene from the film. So you know that she's just kind of being treated in a way I think a lot of people in the 50s and going forward were treated, which is just to kind of like dull the pain, you know, never fully realize it, never fully express it. I don't want to talk about it. But everything is okay now. I just don't want to talk about it. You also have sexual repression where all of these kind of different alternative forms of sexuality were never allowed to be expressed. They were, they were repressed or they were pushed to the underground. And in Blue Velvet, you see this take a particularly brutal form with Frank's sexuality, but as well as Dorothy's sexuality, but that's not fully accepted. Finally, I think you have the, the effects of mass media and especially television and the particular way that they were kind of numbing society to violence, to trauma. I mean, you have this kind of procession of spectacles that replace real social attachments to reality with just simulacra, where violence was just kind of presented as something consumable, where you could watch something incredibly brutal happen and forget about it half an hour later because everything was resolved at the end in this kind of false way, which also ties into this culture of ironic detachment, which was becoming more of a thing in the 1980s and especially into the 90s, where violence was something that could be laughed at, where Everything was kind of treated with this dismissive attitude. And this exploration of American identity is really kind of powerfully represented in the way the characters themselves and their own psychology, the way that they deal with the events of the film. Why is there so much trouble in this world? And I think the film's soundtrack really gets at this. I mean, there's this real mix between naivety and innocence and this really overwhelmingly sad feeling that something has been lost forever. Right, there's a real sense of longing yeah. and sadness. Almost in those unbearable songs. sense of longing. And that's probably what, what Frank Booth is is crying about. I mean, he's relating it to his own life, but we the audience have no idea what that could be, although maybe it's connected to his his obsession with mommies and daddies. Perhaps. It could be. I mean, he he obviously senses the brutality at the heart of this contrast. And again, it's not because naivety is good and, you know, longing is bad. It's because the tension between the two generates this almost overwhelming sense of sadness. You know, this, this feeling that just really 
tears him apart to the point where he's, you know, he's crying when he sees Dorothy Valens sing Blue Velvet. Mm -hmm. But also when when Ben sings in dreams, he's just kind of almost attacked by this feeling of like overwhelming longing, an overwhelming pain that he can't quite articulate or get a handle on. Yeah. And Jeffrey even has a moment of not being able to articulate something when he's in the car with with Sandy and he just can't really bring himself to talk about the stuff that he saw. Well, he, you know, he says, why are there people like Frank? Yeah, why is there so much trouble in this world? He, he's overwhelmed by this feeling that there's an evil out there, which, mm-hmm. which is just so far beyond what he ever imagined. Right. He can't even go into detail about, about it all. He's also overwhelmed by the realization that, that he has the same sort of sadistic tendencies of Frank. I mean, mm-hmm. he ends up abusing Dorothy in much the same ways that Frank does. Right. At least in a much, you know, a much more limited scale. And at her insistence. But he's hitting her. Yep. And it's probably something he never realized he was capable of. Yeah. And, and in fact, he's reduced to tears upon kind of coming to grips with that. For Dorothy herself, I think she's probably more shattered than anyone by the events of the film. First, the horrifying experience of having her own masochistic desires exploited by Frank. Yeah. The same guy who's kidnapped her son and husband and who eventually kills her husband. I mean, imagine getting any pleasure at all from being, you know, sexually brutalized by this guy. It's yeah. got to be just shattering. And to put this on screen as well. Yeah. I mean, just the the audacity of someone to put that on screen. It was just so totally against... American morals, you know? I think that's where a lot of the shock for me came from. Yeah. It's just seeing what Dorothy's going through. And for me, really, probably the, the most powerful moment of the film is is after her final encounter with Jeffrey, when mm-hmm. she appears on his lawn, naked, bruised. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's that moment where Mike, Sandy's boyfriend, maybe ex-boyfriend now, says, oh, is that your mom? You know, like he's almost making fun of it in a way, this incredibly brutal moment that we know was inspired by Lynch's real life experiences. And then she goes inside, they take her inside, and she's just desperately trying to get him to to love her, to commit to something. And they take her out to the ambulance, and she just starts screaming, I'm falling, Mm -hmm. I'm falling. Like at this point, she has nothing left to hold on to. And this is also a reference to a scene they cut earlier on where I think she attempted to jump from a building and Jeffrey rescued her. Oh, yeah, you mentioned with the red shoes yeah. that fall on the suicide attempt. And, you know, she really desires Jeffrey, but not in a really sort of rational kind of way. Right. And so he is now rejecting her because he's with he's with Sandy right. as well. I mean, that's kind of the last straw, I suppose. Oh, indeed. Yeah. Indeed. And then we go to the end of the film. Mm-hmm. And... Order is restored in one sense because Frank is dead. Dorothy is reunited with her son. Jeffrey and Sandy are together. The Robins have returned. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, one of them symbolically has a has a bug in its mouth uh, mm-hmm. showing that the, you know, the underbelly has been uh, taken care of, that order has been restored and things are back to normal. Yeah. But, but it's still a weird looking bird. Well, it's so obviously unhappy. Yeah. You know, for a happy ending... It, it feels anything but. I mean, Jeffrey seems almost to be in a daze. Mm-hmm. You know, he he's not, you don't get a sense that he's genuinely happy in this moment. For Dorothy, I mean, we see an image of her being reunited with her son, but the, the final expression that she bears on her face is deeply troubling mm. and deeply troubled. And then as we alluded to before, there's the fake Robin, which is so obviously fake that I think it really calls into question the reality of Lumberton itself. I mean, the white picket fences, the the firemen waving, going by in slow motion, the, yeah. the roses, the lawns, everything about this place almost becomes this kind of, you know, flagrant artifice by the end of the film. Right, but I mean, this uh, this image of suburbia and this image of the perfect home and the American dream in this case, could, it could be interpreted that it's all just an illusion, isn't it? Well, it is in a sense, but it's also an illusion that Lynch has genuine affection for. And I mm-hmm. think myself, you know, as someone watching the film, these things are objectively beautiful. Yeah. You know, it, it's not like it's something where once the illusion is pulled away, you see the truth and, you know, it, everything is is better. These are illusions that you want to hold on to, that you want to grasp onto. It's right. painful to lose them. Right. And that's why I, I said that line by Ned Flanders. I yeah. wish I lived in the America 
that only exists in the minds of Republicans. That's <laughs> right. Just that, that's the, that is the image that he's talking about. It's as if Lynch is saying that all the forces of this kind of tranquil, small-town existence are nothing compared to all the traumas unleashed in the course of the film. I mean, the brutality that's inflicted on Dorothy, yep. the way that, that Jeffrey's innocence is shattered, even Frank's sort of bizarre psyche and, and how he's constantly attacked by these, these overwhelming feelings of anger and sadness. There's a feeling that, that there's just such an overwhelming sense of trauma that no return to normality is possible in this film. Yeah, the, the experiences that they go through are, are just going to be changing their lives forever happiness is impossible. You can't return to normality again. Mm -hmm. And I think Lynch is saying that in the era of, of Ronald Reagan, American identity really started to become too enraptured by its own idealized version of itself to be able to deal with its own traumas, its own underbelly. Yeah. You know, the, the iconography of small town American existence was so beautiful and so compelling that people preferred the flagrant artifice of white picket fences and this sense of moral absolutism to the reality of their own traumas. Right. And that's still something that goes on today, you know, in politics, when there are still politicians who talk about the United States as this, uh, as this city on a hill and the greatest country in the world and things when it has obvious problems. Very obvious you know, problems. That, I mean, later with, say, Twin Peaks, The Return, these problems become so overwhelming that they actually upset the surface, yep. that the, the surface itself becomes the kind of decaying uh, underbelly, that yeah. that overtakes the surface. And I think that's what happens to trauma in many ways when it's not allowed to be expressed, when it's, when it's not resolved. There's this concept of the return of the repressed, a Freudian idea, which is that if you don't deal with repression or repressed traumas, they will come back in right. one way or another. Because you're not acknowledging them or, or being at peace with them in any, in any way. Right. Yeah. And I think with Blue Velvet, we see the beginning of this, you know, this buildup of trauma that eventually just breaks out in, in Twin Peaks and, and really Mulholland Drive and Lost Highway, well, Highway too. Well, they're all connected, right? They're all yeah. connected because Lynch got the idea for Twin Peaks through Blue Velvet. I mean, right. the town of Lumberton and Twin Peaks are very similar. Twin right. Peaks is also a lumber town, and it also deals with things like the seedy underbelly of, of idyllic suburban life and things like that. Mm. And Mulholland Drive, he got as an original idea for a spin-off movie or TV show of the Audrey character. Right. All right. So all three of them are, in, in their own way, kind of a, a little trilogy. That's very true. And the kind of interest in, I would say, American glamour mm -hmm. and the idealized image of America, I think, plays a big part in Mulholland Drive, too. Yes. And that's also got a big nod to Roy Orbison as well through the song Crying. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, you and I, we're going to be back a lot more for future Now It's Darks. Yes. <laughs> but this will always be the film that gave us our namesake. Exactly. And uh, it's always going to hold a special place for us for that reason. Exactly. I'm very glad that we got together to finally do Blue Velvet. Indeed. In this Indeed. case. And just a reminder, once again, if you've liked what you've heard, if you've liked what we talked about, check out some of the other content on our channel and follow the links below if you want to become a patron and support this channel. There's lots of benefits in store for you. If you can't afford it, liking, sharing, subscribing to us always helps. Stay tuned for a lot more content from Now It's Dark and thanks for watching.